welcome the Kenosha, in Kenosha, the Civil War Museum, and welcome all of you on board with us for your first book club simultaneous with vir our virtual book signing webcast. We welcome you and hope you will do this over and over again. Uh, and uh, both David and Bill will be signing books uh, afterwards, so if you want to have a book inscribed or signed, you can certainly email in uh, or go online right now and order a book and we'll get that done for you and we'll have books signed later on as well. A question that came in from the uh, internet uh, is for you, David. Civil War sites seem to present either an emancipationist or reconciliationist memory of the war. Do you think that sites related to Abraham Lincoln present more of an emancipationist or reconciliationist point of view? That's a good question. He's writing his uh, master's mm. thesis on the subject, and you're his hero. So uh, there well, you are. You sorry can write about a that. page or two. Uh, sites by this sites. This is Sally, by the way, uh, from Texas State University. Hello, Sally, uh, if you're out there. Um, Depends on what you mean by sites. If you mean uh, national park sites, historic sites, I presume, is what you mean. Um, I'm not so sure that Civil War sites provide largely only either an emancipationist or a reconciliationist point of view. There are still some sites where you can find a thoroughly Confederate point of view if, if you really want to go look. I will say this, the, civil, the national park Civil War sites in the past 20 years now have, frankly, in leaps and bounds, have made tremendous, uh, many of us think, progress in bringing the story of causation and consequences and therefore slavery into their site. So that may be what you're referring to. Do Lincoln sites provide? I don't know. I mean, Bill would be a better judge of that than me, and, and so would Dan and anyone in this staff. But I, you know, most Lincoln sites, uh, whether it's Lincoln Cottage in Washington or at Springfield or wherever one goes, are obviously going to stress the Emancipation Proclamation or the Great Lincoln Museum now in, in Springfield because it has become so central to, the, to Lincoln's story, so central to the story of the Civil War. So we can call it Emancipationist, if we, which is a term, by the way, she's drawing, I suppose, from my earlier book. Uh, it, it would seem inevitable, wouldn't it, Bill, that, that uh, the proclamation is bound to be at the center of any Lincoln site, although it might not have always been the case. I That's mean, true. Lincoln's right. memory, as we know from various good books on Lincoln and American memory, has at times been only as the savior of the Union right. rather mm -hmm. than the emancipator, uh, although Lincoln's memory has undergone yeah. so many uh, transformations. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, recreations over time, that it all depends on when one looks well, at I think the, the two should be combined. Uh, we I had to save so. the Union to end slavery. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, if, if the slavery was, if the Union was not saved yeah. uh, at that time, who knows when slavery might have ended. Uh, uh, indeed. Is, uh, Sally, I wish you were here, though, so we could ask you which sites you had in mind. But since you're not, you'll have to email us or something. You know, email in, no. maybe we'll, we'll get to do something a little later on. Uh, Bill, I'm showing here a letter that uh, I just got here in stock, a, a fascinating relic of one of Lincoln's uh, wife's relatives, Alexander Todd, who was a half-brother of Mary and uh, uh, is one of his younger brothers, uh, and he was killed in the war. And here is a George Triplett, who was in camp at Sulphur Springs uh, in east of Jackson, Mississippi, in August of 62, August uh, 25th, and he's showing where Alexander Todd was buried, because he was part of the burial detail and made sure he was there, and he wanted to make sure that the Todds would know where they are, and so after the war, uh, they could come in and, and find him. Now, Lincoln and the Todds, uh, what problems did he have with his <laughs> wife's family, and did they play uh, any part in his relations with Kentucky? Mm. With his relations with Kentucky? Well, I would think his wife, uh, of course, uh, uh, did. Uh, and uh, some of uh, Mary's uh, sisters, full sisters, were, lived in, uh, in Springfield. Uh, and they had husbands who supported Lincoln. Uh, and also uh, uh, his, the, uh, his uh, father-in-law, who was deceased by the time Lincoln won the presidency, but he was an old Whig, old Whig, and uh, very much a Henry Clay person. 
So that influence, uh, I think, ran through, through all of this. Uh, uh, and uh, then Mary had cousins, too. In fact, Lincoln's first uh, law partner was Stuart, uh, uh, who was right. So uh, his brother-in-law brother uh, did support the Union. They're on the... In, in Springfield, yeah. those in Springfield, uh -huh. but not yeah, in not in, uh, the ones in, Kentucky, in Kentucky. But then yeah. they, they were half; uh, they were not uh, full uh -huh. brother and oh, right, 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 I right, guess right. you could say. And right. one, uh, uh, they weren't having family yeah. reunions during the war. No, though, no, <laughs> no, they were not. Uh, although Emily uh, uh, Todd uh, Helms was that her last name? Uh, her, her husband was a brigadier general in the Confederate Army, killed at Chickamauga. Mm -hmm. And she came to, to, to the White House, uh, and Lincoln was a bit uneasy about that. But uh, and Ben Butler, who, uh, not Ben Butler, uh, Sickles, mm -hmm. uh, who was fresh from being wounded at, uh, at uh, Gettysburg, was pretty upset to see her there. Mm -hmm. And he uh, sort of uh, uh, criticized Lincoln. But no, permitting her to, a rebel to live here. Yeah. And he said, I'll look after my family, you look after yours. Mm. And Sandberg has in his, uh, puts a, he's a storyteller, and, and a story may not be accurate, but it's a good story. And he put it in of Lincoln coming before uh, one of the congressional committees, hat in hand, and saying that there are no secessionists living in the White House, everyone, it, you know, be cool. And that they disbanded after that. It's a good story. I, I don't think like it came before what about any, Joshua, com any committee. What about Joshua Speed? Uh, uh, Joshua yeah, Speed was a good was a right, close from Kentucky, friend. Right, he was yeah. Lincoln's friend. best friend right, exactly. from Kentucky. And and he, didn't they break off during the... Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, Speed was pro-slavery, and he was upset with the yeah. emancipation. So they didn't break off communication. But he w no, uh, Speed provided uh, very uh, uh, provided intelligence. intelligence. Uh, for Lincoln oh. during the and war. Of his brother came, went into the second cabin. His, his, oh, his right. older that's brother, right? That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Um, about a quick uh, uh, question about Maryland from Howard here in Chicago. Uh, my home state is Maryland. Did Maryland have fighting units for both the North and the South? And how did the government uh, of Maryland deal with that at the time? Well, the fighting units for the, for the South were, well, they went South right. and they. Uh, but they were Maryland units. They called themselves Maryland units. Uh, uh, but most of the Maryland soldiers in the Civil War were uh, Union. Uh, uh, initially, though, uh, when Lincoln called for troops, Governor Hicks said, we can't supply any troops for the course in the uh, Lower South. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, said that we'll, we'll raise a militia to protect protect Maryland and perhaps uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, but uh, the Maryland had a uh, good many troops. Uh, and the, the Southern Army, troops leaving early. Probably two-thirds uh, of the, the men who served in the, in the war from Maryland were I think from, that's why Lee, from, when he came yeah. in, uh, didn't have any help from Maryland because uh, they'd all left. Those that's who right. would help were already left. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you spoke, David, before about tragedy in life and history. You. Right. There's so much packed into this book. Um, a sense of tragedy is written here makes real hope possible. And mm -hmm. tragedy is useful and even dispensable to understanding history. Mm -hmm. uh, please explain tragedy and mm -hmm. progress briefly for us. Uh, you write that, mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you write that redemptive history sometimes erases tragedy as well. So please yeah. opine a bit on this for us. <laughs> um, Tragedy is a term and a concept that often defies definition. We use the word all the time in our common parlance. What I'm after here, though, is the way in which these writers used it. Um, Warren, Wilson, Catton, or Baldwin. Uh, they used it in different ways, but to, for the same end. Uh, tragedy is an outlook. Tragedy is a, a, a way of viewing human nature, a way of viewing human history. Uh, it's even a mood. Uh, what I did here is I found that all four of these writers explicitly most of the time are trying in their own way through art to get their readers, to get Americans, to get the broader public to develop a sense of tragedy about American history. And by that I don't mean that history is all going downhill. 
the, the, the human beings and history and leadership are all uh, bound somehow to a tether of evil. That's not the point at all. Uh, in Robert Penn Warren's hands or in, or in Baldwin's hands, what they mean by tragedy is that there are events that can only be explained because of the bitter contradictions that drew people into a kind of faded conflict, a brutal, faded conflict that they could not stop, that they could not prevent. So what I did, there's a lengthy, uh, I don't know, six or eight page section of the introduction where I actually tried to reflect on the philosophy of tragedy. I had a wonderful period at the Huntington Library last year and I actually spent about a month where I just checked about 15 or 20 books out of the library by major philosophers, studies of Shakespeare, interpretations of the Book of Job, uh, books by Raymond Williams, uh, books about Aristotle's view of tragedy, and I know that sounds abstract, but what, what, came to, what I began to realize is that the idea of tragedy, which was probably first forged by the great Greek playwrights, Aeschylus and other, uh, others, Euripides in particular, changed over time. There's a medieval conception of tragedy. In Shakespeare, tragedy sometimes has redemption, although not in King Lear. I can't find any there. Um, and, and then, and then you, you, you go into the 18th and 19th century redevelopments of tragedy, and then you, you, you end up in the, that most horrible of centuries of all, the 20th century, the most violent century in human history, where tragedy underwent once again a kind of redefinition in the face of World War I, the Western Front and then in the face of the Holocaust, and so on, and so on. And even now, the way we sometimes use the language of tragedy, even in the wake of 9-11. But these four, these four very serious writers were concerned that Americans seem to be all but congenitally devoted to a view of their history that in the end is always getting better, is always an escalator upward that we are always the people who solve our problems. Now, Robert Penn Warren is telling us, you know what? The Civil War is, a, is, is an illustration that we had a problem we could not solve, short of a near Armageddon, or perhaps it was our Armageddon. James Baldwin is arguing over and over and over again that he grew up in, was educated in, lived in a culture that would not face its past of slavery, racism, and the destruction that the Civil War brought. Edmund Wilson thought we were nothing but a people living by our mythologies instead of by our real history. He was also a bitter pacifist. Um, and then Bruce Catton probably used the word tragedy more than the other three writers. Catton really, though he, he wrote an almost formulaic kind of military history, Catton in the end wanted us to understand that for, for the common soldier and the common family in this country, sometimes the deaths they experienced were not redemptive. When a woman buried three sons, it didn't matter how many letters she got from Lincoln, it didn't matter who spoke at the funeral or what a minister might say, she never experienced redemption. So the point of all of this is that, uh, that if Americans are ever going to develop uh, a serious sense of tragedy and therefore be prepared for the shocks that hit us from history, they ought to begin with their civil war because if, if, if something was ever tragic in our past, this particular event surely was. And, and actually, all I'm really doing with the term tragedy here, just to sum up, is I'm trying to interpret the ways in which these four writers used that language over and over and over again.